Hi, this is our lecture on democracy, moderation, and extremism, otherwise known as post-war, development of Cold War, HUAC, all that kind of stuff smushed together. Um, today's lecture is mostly about McCarthyism, and so, but in order to understand that, we have to have Cold War context. So this is where we're starting. Um, the Cold War was the lens through which most Americans understood international and domestic events during the second half of the 20th century. Communism was a vaguely constituted foil for Americanism. So in other words, it wasn't even really communism versus capitalism. It was seen as communism versus America stuff. Um, and the signs of international and domestic instability really reinforced fears about some kind of impending war or revolution within the United States. Um, that would bring it into the um, communist bloc. So part of this is we have to understand it's not just about military buildup, which is one of the things, but there's a whole bunch of issues that are being debated, right? It's about economic systems, about who gets access to which market. It's about systems of government, but it's also about art and athletics and race and all of these other things um, that really create kind of a two-sided alliance in which you have the NATO nations, which are mostly capitalist, and you have Warsaw Pact nations, which are Soviet influenced. Um, so what I want you to do really quickly is actually pause this video and go to the discussion board for Canvas and answer the question about how does Joseph McCarthy in the primary source I gave you, how does he characterize the post-World War II world. For him, this idea of Cold War rivalry, what does it consist of and what is it like to live in it? So please pause and answer the question on the discussion board now. So internationally, uh, the Korean War's development in the early 1950s was justified on the grounds of what was called containment theory that if one nation fell to communism, other nations would inevitably become communist as well. And domestically, Americans are engaging in what with hindsight seems like a bit of a witch hunt. Um, Left-leaning Americans were conflated with communists as though there was no difference whatsoever. And a small and struggling communist party in the United States was conflated with an international behemoth of the USSR. So the consequence of this is that many people's careers and social lives were ruined when they were accused of participating, sometimes accurately, sometimes not, in an unpopular, but not actually a legal movement. So the place where this really came to a head was the House on Un-American Activities Committee, which most people just called HUAC. Um, so you might wanna try that one out. It embodied a lot of the widespread impulse and animosity and acted with relative impunity under President Truman's executive order to uproot federal employees with disloyal affiliations. Um, there were several problems, however, with the logic underpinning the ensuing movement. Namely this, not all the people who got accused were actually communist. Not all communists were actually pro-Soviet. And American communists who were pro-Soviet actually had pretty darn weak communication with the Soviet Union. Um, but nonetheless, you should know what kind of things HUAC was on the lookout for and why However well or poorly it understood the problem at hand, it became such a powerful force. So please read this slide carefully and go ahead and pause the slideshow until you can do that. So when HUAC testimony started, um, when this congressional committee started demanding that um, American citizens come and give testimony, um, it, Americans in the 1950s widely endorsed um, this kind of impulse wherein uh, belonging to an organization like a union or a defense league or a civil rights group or a charity or having once done so sometime in the past could render a person ineligible for employment. The idea here, the logic, was that these were all organizations that highlighted problems internally in the United States. Right? They pointed to ways in which there was a lack of democracy or wherein there was poverty or these various kinds of problems. And that by pointing out these problems, um, the organizations were seen by non-sympathizers as people who were trying to make the United States look bad internationally, an act that could only be done if they were communist in their origin. So the idea is that you know civil rights groups, for example, 
must have been communist because they pointed out things that were embarrassing to the US and the only reason they would want to embarrass the United States was in order to empower the Soviet Union in comparison. This was not the best logic ever, um, but this was very persuasive to a lot of people. So FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and Attorney General Tom Clark both argued that communism was widespread and that there was more than one communist for every 2,000 Americans. They routinely argued that homosexuals were particularly likely to become Soviet spies because they could be so easily blackmailed. Um, and thus they sought to purge gay and lesbian people from government positions. All of this is especially ironic given that Roy Cohn is one of the main people um, pushing and advocating HUAC's goals and he was a closeted gay man is clearly a matter of record. So in 1947, HUAC turned its attention to Hollywood and attempted to remove people with leftist, not just communist, perspectives from mass media entertainment. Infamously, the HUAC persuaded studio heads such as Eric Johnson, president of the Motion Picture Association, to declare that films like The Grapes of Wrath, which was set against the backdrop of the Great Depression, shouldn't be made because they indicted capitalism. Ronald Reagan was at this point president of the Screen Actors Guild, and he testified to HUAC that Hollywood was full of communists, further stroking the pot fires. Most people called before HUAC agreed to testify because the alternatives, being blacklisted from work at studios, public disgrace, were just so horrible. And here's some of the examples of people who gave testimony. So we have Langston Hughes over here, author of, you know, I Too Sing America that we read earlier, and Walt Disney, who probably requires no introduction. Among these is also Pete Seeger, whose little boxes um, you listen to at the end of the last lecture, um, and who also recorded a wide variety of other folk songs. Um, again, I will remind you that if you ever need a concise answer, don't ask a folk musician. They tend to just ramble on and on and on, as we'll get a taste of during our Zoom session, um, and generally are never outsmarted or outflanked. So not surprisingly, academics and artists were among the most frequently accused. In part, this was because they were people who spoke on the record a lot. In part, it was because they were from fields where in one's politics were traditionally granted a lot of latitude if you had enough talent, and hence fields that attracted a lot of people with provocative ideas and encouraged them to become provocative. People such as, for example, Paul Robeson. So when the Soviet Union exploded an atomic bomb in 1950, um, something that only Americans had been previously able to do, American paranoia about the communists within took all new levels. The McCarran International Security Act required all communists to register with the Attorney General. This was definitely not constitutional. Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was a Republican from Wisconsin, made an otherwise unremarkable career on the basis of his assertions that he had lists of names of communists with government positions, including the State Department. So right now, what I'd like you to do is, again, take a little pause. Um, I'd like you to go and look at the discussion, the second discussion question on Joseph McCarthy. And he has a really interesting way of explaining who he is targeting, right? He keeps targeting people who have, quote, phony British accents, who have had the finest homes or the finest education. And he really seems to have an axe to grind in there. So what I want you to do is reread the primary source. Um, that is put out there, the speech from uh, McCarthy, and then go ahead and answer that question before you continue with the video. So please pause now. So when uh, McCarthy and, uh, McCarthyism was at its high point, um, there were a whole bunch of ways in which um, they would assess on HUAC whether or not somebody was potentially a communist. And as you start looking at this list, um, one of the interesting things about it is that it really suggests a wide variety of things that we normally kind of take for granted. Um, you know, like you look at the third one, receiving funding from an organization interested in international peace. I think all of us would happily accept that grant because free money for what you always already want to do with your art or your intellect is always appealing and international peace doesn't necessarily seem super sketchy. Um, and yet just doing something along those lines could be seen as incriminating when read with such intentions by HUAC. There's also a list of kind of the questions that we can pull out of the historical record. 
what sort of questions HUAC answered that were, you know, arguably almost impossible to answer. If you get, have you ever been a believer in socialism? How do you answer that question without first knowing what the person means by socialism? Right? Have you ever been to the Soviet Union? Well, I mean, if you went on tour, chances were that at some point you at least thought about it. Right? Have you ever written or composed anything sympathetic to communism? Well, if you just say, I met some Soviet people and they seemed pretty nice, does that count? All of these questions were really designed to maximize entrapping individuals. So this led to a wide variety of unsavory choices that were the only choices available if you were called and required to testify in front of HUAC. So I'll go ahead and let you have a second to read this list. So after you finish reading this list, I'd really like you to pause the video and then go again to Canvas into the discussion section and um, provide some answer to the first question about the post office clerk and how he responds to his situation. So please pause now to go do that. So McCarthyism eventually just burned out. McCarthy's hearings through HUAC became widely televised at the moment when he himself started to drink extensively, and he made the fatal decision to challenge the patriotism of the U.S. Army. In this class, I've emphasized that there's a whole list of no-nos, that if you try and do these things, you're just not going to win. One of them is using tanks against veterans, the way that Hoover did. Another is trying to pack the Supreme Court with extra justices, the way that FDR did. To that list, I would say challenging the patriotism of the U.S. Army. You're just not going to win at that point. So some historians have argued that McCarthy actually ruined a perfectly good cause. In other words, the rivalry between capitalist and communist nations was real, but the disputes about domestic communism clouded the issue, and HUAC's hearings eventually um, became obviously irrelevant in ways that undermined Americans' understanding of the scale of the threat internationally. This could have some grounds to it because internationally, really, the world was a very, very precarious place at this moment. So after listening to this, um, we, I want to remind you about upcoming discussion that we have coming on Zoom and ask you to download two things that are in the files area. One is a selection of um, pieces related to um, uh, a section of testimony from various people, including Reagan, and um, Pete Seeger and um, Paul Robeson. And we're actually gonna read those out loud during our discussion time. And in addition to that, there's a worksheet that I'm gonna ask you to fill out either during or after our Zoom meeting so that you can understand a little bit more. So, um, and then the other thing that I need you to do after you do that, and this is just giving you a preview of what we'll be doing, um, is remember that you have a quiz coming up. And so I wanna remind you to go to um, Canvas and go to the quiz section in order to make sure that you filled that as well. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Thank you.